Okay, so we've talked about basics of objects in R, and then, and then we talked about functions and packages. Now we're gonna talk about some of the kind of functions and operations that you're gonna run into pretty regularly, just kind of doing basic math and statistics stuff in R, just to give you a flavor for what R can do. This will definitely not be an exhaustive list of all the math and stats you can do in R. So R does all the basic kind of arithmetic uh, math that you would expect. You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, divide, do exponents, just like uh, if you've used any kind of coding or programming language or typed, you know, typed into any kind of mathematical software at all, you're, you're familiar with. So R uh, works great, just like just like you would be used to. Um, there are also some additional kind of math functionality that you might run into and want to use, things like absolute value, exponential, square root, natural log, uh, logs of other bases. All of those things are doable in R using pretty um, obvious and self-explanatory functions. Obviously, if you wanted to do a square root and you didn't know what it was, you might not want to like guess that it's SQRT, um, in which case, just Google R square root. And I can almost guarantee the first result is gonna be the SQRT function. So um, any kind of basic math functionality you could imagine is gonna be there in R. And if you don't know the actual function, a simple Google search is gonna find it for you. Uh, there's also kind of like statistical functions that you can use, right? So um, just to show some examples, let's go ahead and create this vector that we're gonna, an object called v, which is gonna be a numeric vector from zero to four. So the first line here is saying, let's create this object v. We're gonna assign it using the assign operator to be this sequential vector from zero to four. So then we can type in v and we get zero, one, two, three, four. Great, we've got a sequential numeric vector there. What can we do with that? Well, we can find the mean, we can find the median, we can find the standard deviation, we can find all of those kind of basic statistical uh, moments or objects that we might be interested in. That's all, all available too. And once again, if you're thinking, how do I find the variance? And I might not know that it's VAR, just a simple Google search is gonna find that for you. As we get farther into the course, we're gonna be doing some kind of numerical simulations and that's gonna depend on some random sampling. And so it's gonna be useful to talk about kind of sampling functions and other kind of uh, distributional functions that you might wanna use. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning at this point is uh, when we get into that stuff, anytime you're doing anything with randomness in your code, you're gonna to wanna to set a seed first. And this this might seem a little confusing, but when you ask a computer to generate random numbers, it's not actually generating random numbers. There's some kind of pseudo random algorithm in the computer or in the, the software that you're using that is, uh, that's generating the numbers. And if you don't set a seed, it's essentially drawing, it, it, it somehow uses the, I think the, time, the clock time on your computer to kind of initialize this pseudo random algorithm. What setting a seed does is it sets a different initialization of this pseudo random algorithm, which means that if you set a seed and draw some random numbers, then reset the exact same seed and draw new random numbers from the same distribution, you're gonna get the exact same numbers. So uh, it, it allows for replicability in randomness, which might not seem random um, in some uh, metaphysical sense or something like that, but it's close enough, we can call it random. And uh, you know, when you're running code, when you're, when you're writing a paper, doing research to, for, for a paper or something, you're not going to want it to be the case that every time you run your code, that includes some randomness. You're doing some, you know, maybe you're, 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 you're estimating random coefficient logit model that's going to have some numerical simulation in it um, that requires drawing random numbers. You don't want new results to pop out from new random draws every single time you run your code. You want to generate the same results every time. You want your results to be replicable. So you're gonna to have to set a seed. So that's what this set.seed function does here. We could use any number. I'm gonna use 703 for the entire course for setting a seed. We're gonna set seed 703 um, just so if, if I did this multiple times, if you do exactly this, 
you'll get these same numbers, we can all get exactly the same thing by setting that seed 703. We can do it multiple times on different computers, we're all gonna get exactly the same results. So let's set that seed just so we're gonna see the same thing if we run this code. Um, and then, you know, we can do something like drawing from a random normal. So in R, uh, these the kind of uh, distributional functions all have a similar, uh, a similar kind of uh, structure to the name of the function. In this case, we're drawing a random number from the normal distribution. There are similar functions for uniform, which is R, unif, R, binome for binomial and so on. So what we're doing here is we're drawing random numbers from a normal distribution. We're gonna draw five numbers with a mean zero and a standard deviation of the square root of two, or basically a variance of two. And so we do that and R draws some of these pseudo random numbers for us. If we'd put in a different seed, we'd get different numbers. If we hadn't put in a seed at all, we'd get different numbers, but we couldn't then reproduce those numbers. Um, if we have a vector, remember on, I think the last slide, we created that V vector that was zero through four. We can ask R to randomly sample from that vector. So in this case, we're asking it to sample from that vector 10 times with replacement. And so we get a, a random draw, 10 numbers with replacement from zero through four. Um, there are also things like you can calculate the CDF of a standard normal at a given Z value. So that's gonna be the P norm. There are also similar like P for the T distribution, P for all these different distributions to, to get a CDF. And so we can ask R to give us the CDF uh, of, of the normal distribution at a Z stat of 1.96, for example. All of these are things you're gonna run into as you're thinking about doing, uh, kind of doing, coding up your own estimators and doing inference on them. Um, okay, we talked in, in one of the earlier uh, videos about how one of the kind of common structures of, of objects is a vector. One of the nice things about vectors is that uh, if you apply a, uh, some kind of mathematical or statistical operation to a vector, oftentimes it will kind of like apply that, uh, that operation to every element of the vector. So here's an example, V, remember this V object that we created earlier was that vector zero, one, two, three, four. And if we go way back to one of the early slides in these lectures, A is just the number one. So we take a five element vector and add the number one to it. And what R does is it adds one to each of the elements of the vector. So V was zero through four, we add one to it, now we get out a vector one through five. We can do the same thing with multiplication, multiplying by two, we get zero, two, four, six, eight. We can plug it into the exponential function and now R is gonna take the exponential of each one of those. So the exponential of zero gives us one, the exponential of one gives us 2.71, the exponential of three gives us 7.4 and so on. Uh, we could take the natural log of each element. So a log of zero through four. Well, the log of zero is, uh, it returns negative infinity for us because uh, we can't really log uh, zero. Uh, if we log one, we get a zero. If we log two, we get a 0 0.69 and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's doing that operation on every single element for us just through one line. Uh, that's what happens sometimes if you just give R, if you try to add like a vector and a single number, you can also add two vectors together and R is gonna be smart and realize, oh, now you're giving me two vectors that are the same length and so you want me to add pairwise, uh, uh, you know, add the corresponding elements to one another. So if we take that V vector zero through four, and add it to a new sequential vector one through five. You know, we're taking, what R is gonna do is take the first elements and add them together. So zero and one, add them together and we get one. The second element of each of these vectors is a one and a two. R is gonna add one and two together and give us three. Then it's gonna add two and three together and give us five and so on. 
So if you add a vector plus a number, it adds the number to every element of the vector. If you add a vector plus a vector, it adds element wise. Um, I think this is pretty intuitive and makes sense, but it's just something to be aware of. It, it actually works really nicely that the same, um, you know, the same keystrokes will, will do different things that's context specific in a way that I think is pretty intuitive. Um, so like multiplication works exactly the same way as addition here. If we take our zero through four V vector and multiply it by one through five, it's gonna multiply the first element, the second element, the third element, and so on. The thing to be aware of here is what happens when you try to add vectors of different lengths. Um, it doesn't really, work well. Uh, so I would recommend just not doing that. R does weird things where then it just like starts recycling from the beginning of the vector again. Anyway, it will give you a warning if you do this. So you can see here we try to add a five element vector plus a four element vector and R gives, it does something, but it gives us a warning. These things aren't the same length. This isn't, th this probably isn't what you want to do. Um, you may, as you do some math or stats, want to get into, you might have a long vector and you want to grab a single element out of it. And the way we're going to do that is using these brackets. Um, for example, suppose you want to pull out the second element of that V vector. If we just say V bracket two, it's going to pull out the second element and it's going to give us that uh, second element, which is one. We can take out more than one element at a time, access multiple elements by passing it a vector of numbers instead of a single number. So in this case, we're saying we have this V vector. We want to pull out the second and the fourth element. So we have to give it a numeric vector of two and four. And then it pulls out the second and the fourth element and we get a one and a three. Um, we can also tell it access everything but a certain element. So if we say, uh, if we put a negative one in the brackets, for instance, it's going to access everything but the first element. It's gonna essentially drop the first element and just give us the second through fifth elements, which are one, two, three, four in this case. Um, you can also like go in and replace an element. You can tell it, I wanna kind of like grab that first element of the V vector and assign it to be five instead of zero. And then we can see here, we've replaced that, that first element with a five, which where it was originally a zero. So that's gonna be useful as you think about maybe pulling out uh, you know, there will be, there will be cases where you want to pull out certain elements from a vector and that's how you do it. I mentioned this before, uh, matrices usually work like vectors. Um, we have a matrix here. Uh, we're going to, or we, we can create a matrix here called M, which is just one, two, three, four. If we take the mean of that matrix, it just takes the mean of those four numbers. It, it kind of removes the dimensionality of the matrix and just does the mean of those four numbers. If we take the log, right, a log, when we did that on a vector, it applied the log to every element of the vector. Now taking the log of a matrix is gonna take the log of every element of the matrix and leave us with the, the matrix structure. So it works just like that. Most things are gonna work just like vectors. It's just that, uh, you know, your results are gonna be left in a matrix form instead of a vector form. Um, if you add or subtract matrices, that's going to happen element-wise, just like with uh, just like with vectors. So I've got an example here. I won't talk you through it because it's pretty straightforward. If you want to take a look at the code and uh, on your own, you you can do that and and run this code and see how matrix addi addition and subtraction would work. One note on matrix multiplication: if you just multiply two matrices together it is going to multiply those matrices element-wise. So it's, like I said, it's trying to treat a matrix as a vector and it's just gonna multiply, if we have two two by two matrices that we multiply together, it's gonna take that upper left element from each of those and multiply them together. It's not gonna do what you think of as matrix multiplication. To get the kind of typical matrix product that you might be thinking of when you multiply matrices together, you have to use this uh, percent sign multiply percent sign syntax. It's a little weird, but it's essentially telling R, don't treat this matrix as a vector, like a, a structured vector, treat it as an actual matrix and give me the matrix product instead of element wise matrix multiplication. We are gonna to get to a place where we're doing matrix multiplication matrix products and we're gonna to wanna to do this. And so it's, so it's useful to point that out now. 
Um, there are also some special functions just for matrices. You can take the transpose, it's just T. You can take the inverse of a matrix, it's called solve, which maybe isn't the most intuitive, but, but there it is. Uh, to find the inverse, you just solve the matrix. Uh, and you can access elements of a matrix very similarly to how we accessed elements of a vector. It's just now we have two dimensions to think about instead of just one. So we're actually gonna pass two arguments into the brackets. The first designates the row and the second designates the column. So if we pass M and then in brackets two comma one, we're taking the second row, the first column, kind of the bottom left element of that matrix in this case. And you can flip back and see, yes, we define that to be a two and here we pull it out as a two. If you leave the column argument blank here, we just put in one comma, it's going to pull out the whole first row without pulling out a particular column. Similarly, if we just put in the second, uh, second argument here, so comma two, it's just going to access the column and not the row. So we'll get the whole second column here as a vector. So that was a little bit about kind of doing math with numbers, vectors, and matrices. Next, we're going to move on to probably the most common way that you'll kind of interact with things in R, which is data sets and data frames. So we'll talk about that in the next video.